All right, good day to everybody. It is May 23rd and we're finishing up the book of Ezra today, chapters eight through 10. So as we finish up the book of Ezra, we finish up the second act of Ezra Nehemiah, uh, the second section. We finished yesterday with the transporting of the vessels, that is the holy vessels of the temple to the temple. And then chapter seven really begins, uh, should, should be, it really should be uh, the beginning of chapter eight, where Ezra now is speaking. He is speaking in the first person, and um, he writes starting in, um, oh, let's do verses 28. Well, let's do 27. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to glorify the house of the Lord in Jerusalem and who extended to me steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers, I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was upon me and I gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. So this is Ezra writing that he has been given a commission and he's thankful and he sees this as the hand of God upon his life and he is bound and determined to fulfill the commission to go to Jerusalem and to see to its continued rebuilding. So uh, you get uh, um, the first thing he does is to assemble representative leaders and we get uh, an account. It, it, might be, it could be viewed somewhat uh, as an interruption in that this is not all the representative leaders as these are the heads of families and the, given the genealogies of this wave, this next wave of emigration into Jerusalem. So it goes up through verse 14 uh, of these persons and their descendants. Uh, so that list is there. And uh, then we get uh, into um, uh, starting with verse 15. One of the things that's important to notice, Ezra notices that there are no Levites gathered. He wants Levites. He needs assistants, servants in the temple, and he knows the law says that it should be Levites. And so in the past, before the exile at times, the people in the temple were not only worshiping false gods, but they weren't Levites. So we're going to fulfill the law here. We're going to do what the law says. So he needs to make sure there are enough Levites to take care of temple service. So that point is mentioned. Um, uh, and the second thing Ezra does is he proclaims a fast, uh, which the people petition uh, God for a safe journey for themselves and for their children, and we're told their possessions. Um, and the fast is to replace the imperial soldiers. Now, this is really interesting that uh, we'll find in Nehemiah that Nehemiah comes alone and he comes with soldiers guarded by soldiers. Ezra doesn't want to ask for soldiers. Uh, they're carrying significant things. Uh, of value, and they could they could fall prey to robbers or bandits along the way. But Ezra wants to rely on God, so there's going to be no soldiers. So he gives uh, the the Levites uh, what they need, and they all hide it amongst themselves. But they travel without imperial soldiers, trusting in God to get them there. Um, he identifies, I said, Levites, I meant priests. He identifies 12 priests uh, to carry the offerings and the different kinds of valuables that are going to go into the temple. And uh, um, so off they go from Babylon, or known to them by then, Persia, to Jerusalem. So we get the rest of the chapter, and chapter 8 sort of recounts the voyage and the journey um, and the description of the journey is uh, not given to us in any kind of detail. Uh, but what they want to emphasize that the vessels make it safely to the temple, they arrive where they're supposed to, and uh, they conclude with the sacrifices in the temple as a thanksgiving to God. And of course, that they have fulfilled the delivery of all the king's edicts. So here again, you have this idea that it is God, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews, who is actually overseeing this return, and it's in his providence, but that the Persian monarchs are being used by God, even if they don't know it, even if they're unwitting vessels for God's will, they are indeed following God's will in permitting the Jews to return to Jerusalem. Now, 
um, we begin to get a problem. Starting uh, in 836, the story takes a real interesting dramatic turn. Um, Persian uh, patronage for the temple uh, becomes the context, the backdrop of this. The Persians, this cannot happen without Persian support. Um, but we get a crisis in view, and the crisis has to do with uh, foreign marriages. Now, we've talked about this before. Um, one of the things that the law says is that you shall not marry women from other uh, countries, other peoples. And as I've mentioned, said the main concern for this is not marrying foreign people, people of different ethnicities. This isn't, an, this isn't a problem of interracial marriage as we would call it today. It's not about interracial marriage. That's not the issue. It's, it's uh, marrying uh, women of other religions who will bring that religion into the home and will then raise their children to become idol worshipers. So you don't marry women who worship Baal or Astarte or anything like that. Um, and, and of course we find out that this is one of the problems that Israel has is that they do involve an intermarriage and um, it is a problem for worshiping the one true God because of that uh, idolatrous influence. Now, it's important to note that there certainly are marriages that are certain are tolerated and even approved by God. Remember when Miriam and Aaron are complaining about uh, Moses's African wife and uh, God judges them for it. And we have other examples in the Old Testament where marriage to foreign women is not a problem. So apparently what's going on in that context is that you have marriage mar uh, marriages to women in other and from other families of nations who are not worshipers of other gods. So uh, if indeed Moses's wife from Africa worships Yahweh, no problem. So the issue, so the issue is not a blanket prohibition against inter uh, ethnic interracial marriage. It has to do with the religious matters. Well, one thing that we're told here is that this is exactly what is happening. Uh, people are marrying the people of the land and the people of the land, remember, are not immigrant, immigrants from, from Babylon. They are the people who've been living in the land for decades. People who were left after uh, the deportation to Babylon, people who were imported from earlier generations, from the Assyrians who imported people into the north of Jerusalem, or the, to the north of Jerusalem in the Northern Kingdom. And these people married and intermarried. And so one of the things that Ezra is discovering is not only is that happening, it's happening among the leadership, it's happening among the Levites and the priests. And Ezra is beside himself over this because he sees this as a threat. He sees this as the beginnings uh, of what got Israel in trouble in the first place the worship of false gods and feeling that the women, uh, the wives are going to lead their husbands and their children astray. Now, it's really interesting to note um, that the peoples mentioned that are actually listed uh, are really peoples that no longer exist. So, um, the writer is, is listing what traditionally has been uh, Israel's enemies throughout the stories we've been reading. And the list is the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Parasites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Well, except for the Egyptians, these folks don't really exist anymore. I mean, they, they too have been defeated. Their genealogies, their ethnicities have been, quote unquote, watered down. By intermarriage, and so they really don't exist anymore. But these are Israel's traditional enemies, and so when the writer uh, refers to these foreign women by these names, it is it is raising the concern of bringing back old idolatries. Okay, so Ezra really um, um, uh, rustles over this. He fasts. He prays to God trying to figure out what the solution is. It's not an easy solution because these are families, uh, women and children. And what do we do? Because these, these people are dependent upon 
uh, their husbands, right, for a living and for a way of life. So the conclusion is, and there's some disagreement as to exactly what the conclusion is. Um, let me read to you, uh, well, first of all, these kinds of mixed marriages are certainly denounced and, and not to be practiced, but let me, uh, let me finish Ezra out and to read just so we can see what, what the issue is here. So you get a whole list of, uh, uh, of uh, persons and their descendants. Um, these are of the priests, the descendants of the priests who married foreign women. And uh, we get to the last part of Ezra and verse 44 says, all these had married foreign women and they sent them away with their children. So there are certainly commentators who believe that basically they sent the women and children away by themselves. Now this, is, this to any person who is sensible is got to be uh, an appalling thing that you would take these women who are dependent and these children who are dependents and just send them away to fend for themselves. That is, that is one reading. Another reading of it is that they are not sent away as in they're not sent off to go live somewhere else and defend for themselves, but they are sent away to live uh, away from the husbands and fathers. They continue to be cared for. The husbands and fathers still continue to care for their children and their wives. It's just that the living arrangement is of such is that the fathers, in a sense, live uh, for all practical purposes away from their families. So at least it provides for families to be provided for, but it's still a tough thing, isn't it? Because you've got children who love their fathers, right? Who care about their fathers, want to see their fathers, and now they're living away. They may see them uh, relatively uh, uh, few times uh, at best. And same thing with the wives who no doubt love their husbands and the husbands who love their families. And this, so this is really tough to do. This is tough. Uh, this is a tough pill to swallow. It certainly is interesting to raise the question whether this was the best solution or not. Would a better solution have been the problem all along throughout Israel's history? And that is the failure to teach the law, the failure to teach what it meant to be the covenant people. We see this all throughout what we've read in the Old Testament so far, is that it is up to the priests, the Levites, to teach the law, to instruct the people in the ways of the covenant, because, uh, again, uh, not everybody has copies of that, right? These are ancient documents, and, and you just don't copy them willy-nilly. But, the, but what often happens is the priests and the Levites fail to teach the law, Part of that is the responsibility of kings who are idolaters and who don't want to teach or they neglect it and teach other things. So one wonders that had the law been continually, the Torah continually being held before the people and taught on a regular basis, if not God's people would have had less of a problem with all these idolatrous ways. Would it have better to say instead of Instead of living, sending these wives and children off to live without, functionally without the provider, provider and, and main caregiver, um, you know, and except to be cared for, you know, from a distance. So let's say it that way, be cared for from a distance. Wouldn't it have been better for Ezra to focus on that we've got our job cut out for us in teaching the law and teaching the covenant. We've got to make sure uh, because we have people in our midst now who don't come from our heritage, who don't come from our ethnicity. Uh, and you do get the impression that uh, there is some reference to the seed of Israel being in a sense watered down and mixed with this breeding, interbreeding, so to speak. Wouldn't the, the solution have better been to be more zealous in teaching the law to everybody, not just, not just the Jews, but to everybody? There's also some question here as to whether or not this, uh, this decision to put away wives and children was really made only by the priests who had taken wives, that the rest of the populace is not uh, included in this. It's hard to know. But it seems to me that a, a better solution that would have not only 
represented the importance of the particulars of God, Israel as God's people and their calling was to emphasize universally, specifically what makes God's people God's people, the calling and the keeping of the law and the teaching of the law, that this might have been a better solution. Now, it wasn't the solution they took, and God still works with God's people. By the way, you'll notice there's nothing in this text. Uh, that tells us God spoke to Ezra and told him to do this, or there's no instructions. He's, he certainly is seeking discernment, uh, and we can credit Ezra for that. He wants to seek God's discernment and God's will. But in the end, we just uh, it just seems to me that there was probably a better a solution than separating these, uh, these men from their, their wives and children even though they were still going to be cared for by them, but out of relationship with them. And, you know, if there's anything about the covenant, it's important. It's the relationship of the covenant, the relationship of the people to God and the relationship of each person to one another. So anyway, that's the decision that was made. And so they go with it and we end with Ezra. And tomorrow we begin the third act of the Ezra Nehemiah drama. And that's the entire uh, 13 chapters of Nehemiah. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this wonderful day. Thank you for the relationship that we have with you and with one another because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who died for our salvation. We thank you for him. We thank you for the calling that he's given to us. And may we be discerning uh, and seek your will the way Ezra did as we, as we seek to, to to make the best decisions that, that best reflect your will for us and for others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, we will see you tomorrow.